Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. Featured on this week's show, an interview with a fine grain farmer from Streeter, Illinois, Norbert Schmidt, and on the Farm Report from the Schmidts at Streeter later in the show. Our special studio guest is Mr. John Oster. John is assistant director of the Grain Commodity Department of the National Farmers Organization. John, it's always a pleasure to welcome you to U.S. Farm Report. Thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here. John, I was most impressed with Norbert Schmidt and his farming operation near Streeter, Illinois, and he tells me that good things are happening through that region in terms of some contracts. What's going on there? There are good things happening there, Bill. In addition to making export sales out of that area, along with the sales in the interior, we have a contract in that area, a producer contract for edible soybeans for export to Japan. And this is produced on an acreage basis, and this, we hope, will be a long-range program and give us a lot of more future contracts on similar commodities. Well, I think you will see in the interview to follow that Norbert grows some of those edible soybeans. In fact, as I recall, he has about 40 acres of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's quite excited about that. We are too, Bill, because we think this is going to be the future of agriculture. John, how are things generally in the grain department? Things are really moving, Bill. We've added uh, some staff people here in our headquarters here at Corning, Iowa, some new people. We have uh, George Brannon came in from Idaho and a new man by the name of Bruce Hendrickson from Maryland. We've added here to our staff, plus we've added a lot of people to the staff out across the field and out in the field. Mm -hmm. So we feel we've got a pretty well-rounded staff now. We need just a few more people. We've pretty well got the nation blanketed now with good staff people out in the area. Well, now, this is part of the accomplishment uh, possible as a result of the increased dues, isn't it? Yes, sure adding is, adding of personnel. Yes, sir. This is what we'd promised the people, and this is what we have done. Exactly. Now, if there is any slowness to it, I know the reason, and that is that you choose people most carefully. You screen them carefully. Definitely. Because you want only the top people in the country. Right. And uh, they're not all that easy to come by, are they? No, a lot of the top people out there have a large farming operation and are really reluctant to break their ties with mm -hmm. it. But they're also understanding more and more all the time that price is probably the most important product of agriculture today. Yes, indeed. You mentioned when we were talking about Norbert Schmidt and the uh, edible soybeans uh, grown for export to Japan, that you felt this was the future, really, uh, for agriculture. Now, you've been making export sales. Can NFO, in making export sales, get more for export than the big grain companies? We sure can, Bill, and it's strange that you would ask that because recently I attended the Mid-Southern Soybean Shippers and Grain Dealers Association Convention, and one of the grain dealers asked me the same question. And we have uh, proof in several occasions now in wheat, milo, corn, and soybeans, that in every case where we have made export sales, we were able to negotiate out a better price than what the buyers at the ports were offering or even backed off into the interior were offering. Well, now, how have you accomplished it? Well, I think there's two reasons. Uh, one, we are a major source of supply, and we have the product. And the buyers know that they can depend on that supply and be furnished with the volume they need. The other is, I don't think that it is the responsibility of the buyers nor have they accepted as part of the responsibility to get price for farmers. They're interested more in just handling the volume, mm -hmm. and they're not interested in getting a price for agriculture. It's not the responsibility, it's the producer's responsibility, and this is where NFO fits in. Mm -hmm. What um, kind of, uh, what kind of uh, shipping are you doing? Is, is most of the export done by barge and ship? A lot of it is where we can get uh, barge facilities. Uh, some is done by rail. I have a picture here bill of a barge that was used on an export of white wheat out on mm -hmm. the west coast. It was moved out of the interior of Washington by barge to the port elevator at Portland, Boy, that's where a, we load the vessel. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge barge. That's it a dandy. It looks like a, a big capacity. Right. Uh, their NFO came through in flying colors and moved a large volume of grain in a short period of time. Well, so much for export, and I know that you could go on uh, and tell us a great deal more about it. And before we do leave export, as a matter of fact, I would like for you just to comment briefly on your recent uh, trip. Well, recently, Bill, about, oh, it's been 30 days ago now, I guess, I made a trip abroad to Syria. We had an inquiry from Syria to buy a large volume of grain over a long period of time. And we tried to negotiate it 
through cables and telephone conversations, but due to the poor connection and probably the vagueness in the conversation, we thought it was worth the trip, and I think it really was worth the trip to go there. They mm -hmm. are interested in buying a large volume of grain over a long extended period of time. However, they do want to buy on credit. And here is one of the hang-ups that we have right at the moment where the government is no longer extending CCC credit mm -hmm. to the middle, some of the Middle East countries. We hope to be able to circumvent that and get this credit reestablished. And once we do this, we'll open the door for a large volume of United States grain going to the Middle East, and they have the need for it. John, what's the new crop outlook? Well, on soybeans, we are in agreement with what the government says on all the reports that we get. And I think here again is where farmers have a real benefit to having a nationwide organization in regard to market information. We have a nationwide organization with member producers and staff people out in, out, actually out in the field, seeing the crop as it looks. And we're in agreement with the government on the soybean projection of a larger crop than we had a year ago. The soybeans look good all over, the color is good, and the pod formation on the beans is very good. So we feel, too, that's going to be up. Mm -hmm. However, we strongly disagree with what the government says, that the new corn crop will only be down 6%. And they say it's mostly in the south where the corn acreage is not extensive. It is probably the most severe in the south, but the past month we've been making a survey on our own of all of our corn producers across the big corn areas of Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa, in Minnesota, and the Dakotas, and Nebraska, some Missouri, and Kansas. And we have a combination of things. It isn't only the southern leaf blight that is taking its tremendous toll. Uh, we estimated that the tonnage is going to be down somewhere around between 20 and 25 percent. I'm talking about the bushel per acre yield now. It's going to be down somewhere mm -hmm. between 20 and 25 percent nationwide due to the leaf blight, the fungus, and the drought, which is real severe in the Dakotas and Nebraska, across Kansas, on into Texas. And then in addition, uh, the quality factor on the corn, which I don't think the government has even taken into consideration, uh, the test weight on the corn, we've had reports down as low as test weight is 32 percent, or 32 pound test weight, mm -hmm. which is real severe. Plus the feeding value of the corn is going to be off. So we're in sharp disagreement with the government on the corn. And I think that before the new year rolls around, we'll see revised figures coming from the government, lowering it much lower than the 6 percent they came out with now, a week ago. Yeah. Well, the old idea of supply and demand went uh, out the back door in agriculture in reality many, many, many years ago, didn't it, John? Well, I don't know as it went out so many years ago, Bill, but it has been going out, and I think a good example is soybeans. Mm -hmm. uh, here we're looking at probably the largest crop on record in the history of soybean production. Uh, our exports have not increased enough to... Uh, take up the excess. Right, to yeah. take up the excess to substantiate this price increase, uh -huh. and we're looking at the highest price for soybeans at harvest time that we have in several, several years. Well, aren't we looking at $3 soybeans? We sure are. We sold some for export at $3. Yeah. Uh, we sold them, we started out at a lower price than that, and then on up to $3, and I think it's the first time in a long time that harbor farmers could expect that high price for beans at harvest time. John, on our recent field trip, we got into the Carolinas, and we saw this, uh, this southern uh, leaf blight in the cornfields there. And it's really ornery looking. It looks like corn that's had a hard freeze, you know? Mm -hmm. Have you seen it around the Midwest at I've all? I've seen just spots of it, and what the information we've been getting in through our communication department mm -hmm. is what they've related the same thing. Now, we didn't uh, notice any of it in those parts of Illinois we visited, for example, around the uh, Streeter area, where we did visit with Norbert Schmidt. Uh, and speaking of him, join me, if you will, and let's go there and, uh, and visit with Norbert and his family. Real fine. U.S. Farm Report has learned through many months of association with NFO members all across the land that NFO people are the most hospitable, kindest, loveliest people in all the world. Our entire U.S. Farm Report crew is near Streeter, Illinois, and our host and hostess certainly personify what I have just said about NFO people. I'm speaking of Norbert and Lois Schmidt. It's real nice of you to have us out today. Nice to have you here, Bill. Thank you very much. Lois, I understand that uh, you work. 
If they do, Bill. I mean, in addition to uh, keeping house here and being a mother. And... Full-time job. Well, what do you do? I work at Camelot Manor, which is a sheltered care home in Streeter, Illinois. And I work as a nurse at the, the 7 to 3 shift, five days a week. Well, now, she didn't uh, take this on, did she, Norbert, uh, until after uh, at least two of the three kids were raised, huh? This is very true. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of those two kids, uh, Norbert and Lois uh, have two daughters in addition to a 15-year-old son. Both of these girls uh, were married in the past year, and I think that, uh, by golly, we've got to take our hats off to you for that accomplishment. That's kind of a shocking thing, isn't it, to get two of them married in the same year? We hate to lose all of our family in one year, yeah, or most of them. Now, let me ask you about uh, what first attracted you, Norbert, to NFO. Well, uh, Bill, this goes back uh, to my school days, high school days. And uh, this is probably a very unusual situation, but we had a, a high school teacher, an ag teacher, Mr. Walter Basinger back in 1935 to 39. That brought this uh, need uh, for better marketing on the farm up to us fellows at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, he told us at that time that uh, we would have no trouble producing a crop or a livestock. He said, your biggest problem will be trying to sell this production. And uh, this is very true. Uh, when we started into farming, and uh, as time went on, I knew what this gentleman was talking mm -hmm. about. And uh, when NFO came along, uh, it looked like uh, this was the answer to some of our problems. How long ago was it that uh, NFO came along for you? Eleven years ago. Uh -huh. And you've been a very active NFO member through the years, haven't you? I was a charter member at that time, and... Uh, Mr. Walter Basinger was, too, our ag teacher. Norbert, your uh, family farm, the farm on which you were raised, uh, is very near here, isn't it? It's just a quarter of a mile from where we live now, Bill. Is the farm still in your family? My father lives there, and my sister and her husband and children. Well, now, uh, your father is how old, Norbert? Seventy-four. Is he still an active farmer? Uh, more or less, yes. Yeah. He helps us out. Yeah, he's quite a fellow, in fact. Uh, we met him today, and... Uh, uh, Mr. W.W. W. Butch Swain of the Public Information Department at NFO, along with the U.S. Farm Report crew, met him and visited with him today, and he's a fine fella. By the way, that's quite a family farm over there, too, you know, <laughs> with the kids and the ponies and the dogs. It's quite a place. There's a little bit of everything over there. Yes, they, they have a lot of livestock. Uh, the kids raised hogs, uh, as you've noticed, probably. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. How big a farm is that, the original family farm? 160 acres. Now, when you decided to spread out in farming, uh, Norbert, where did you go from there? Well, we moved uh, just about a half a mile east of the family farm, and we rented uh, 250 acres uh, from Arthur Shea uh -huh. over at Streeter. And his yeah. wife uh, still owns the farm, Mrs. Ethel Shea. And are you still uh, farming that land? Yes, yes, we do. We still farm the ground. Mm-hmm. We have a, a hired man, a full-time hired man, who is tenant or living in the house now, yes. who helps us out. Yes. <clears throat> That's a, a, a very neat-looking farm. Uh, it's it's well-maintained, and I think uh, this is to your credit, as well as to uh, Jim Wilson. Isn't that his name, yes. your hired man? Yes. As well as to his. Thank you, Bill. It's very attractive, and, uh, and we enjoyed uh, looking that over today. Thank you. Now, after you rented this land, then uh, you decided to get in the middle between the family farm and the rented property and buy some land. Uh, we're now uh, situated on that, are we not? Right. We are sitting on uh, the original uh, farm that we bought uh, 22 years ago. Uh -huh. uh, there was 220 acres. 220. 220 in that. Yeah. Now, you are farming how many acres altogether? Uh, 760. 760. Altogether. Now, what are you raising? What what crops uh, predominate in your farming operation? Uh, corn is our main uh, crop. And then uh, soybeans, of course. And we raise uh, some certified seed oats for uh, some people in mm -hmm. Pontiac, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a hay crop, of course, to feed our beef herd with. And uh, this year... Uh, uh, we are growing some edible 
beans for Pacific Grain Company mm -hmm. down at Farmer City, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And these beans will be exported to the Japanese. Now, you built the home in which we are sitting today in 1968. Uh, and incidentally, uh, it's a lovely home indeed. I know that both of you must have planned for many, many years uh, what has become a reality. Isn't that right, Lois? Yes, indeed. Many, many years. And in fact, uh, maybe this is one of the reasons that you worked so hard at an extra job, huh? Yes, uh -huh. it certainly was, Bill, because uh, it was something that I planned and dreamed for for a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, didn't NFO have sort of a part in, in the planning and uh, the final construction of this house? Well, I would certainly think so, uh, Bill. It's just like playing a game of poker, and I guess I'm betting on the come. Yes, you are. And, and uh, uh, I think I'm going to I'm think I'm going to win out. And this is uh, with this with this attitude of optimism, you went ahead and built the house that you and uh, Lois have always wanted. This is true. Yeah. Well, it certainly is indeed a lovely home, and uh, we're just delighted to be here. Incidentally, you're quite a grass man. You know that? You've There's grown... a little bit of luck involved there. Well, what Bill happened? And... This man, uh, ladies and gentlemen, has one of the finest bluegrass lawns uh, that I've ever seen, and you planted it when? We planted it in March of 1969. How do you account for the fact that you're so good at that? Uh, the good Lord and the weather had a lot to do with that, uh... Bill. Well, yeah. have a son that What's that, Lois? He has a son that maintains it very well. <laughs> yeah. That does help a little bit. Our son it? David keeps it in real nice shape. Well, let's talk about David for a minute. You know, we've enjoyed visiting with David today, and uh, uh, he uh, is a member of uh, the Future Farmers of America. Right. And he's a 4 H'er. And in fact, uh, we were delighted to uh, see his project, his 4 H project, his two calves. And. Uh, uh, he's really enthusiastic about it, isn't he? He certainly is. Uh, he was over there working hard all day on those calves, yeah. getting them ready to show. Well, now, how soon will the uh, will the big showing occur at the at the fair? This Sunday. This coming Sunday. This Sunday, and then Monday they start showing. Well, we certainly do want to wish David a lot of luck on that. He also uh, uh, has some hogs, doesn't he? He has a swine project. Yeah, well, that's wonderful. Well, well Norbert, as you know, NFO is making every effort in the world to save the family farm. And I know that you have two married daughters. I know that David now is coming along at age 15. Uh, what is your intention about uh, your farming operation where David is concerned? Well, um, he will probably take uh, another four or five years uh, to make up his mind and also to uh, keep on with his education and finish it mm -hmm. before he decides what he wants to be. And uh, at this time, I would certainly like to keep this unit together for him, if at all possible, because uh, uh, there is a strong possibility that he may have to farm more than we are farming mm -hmm. to make a living. I hope this is not true. Mm -hmm. This is one reason why we hope very much that uh, the NFO is a success. Well, if NFO is a success, and uh, we have every indication that it is certainly that today, uh, the exodus from the family farms of America on the part of these young people, like your David, perhaps will be slowed considerably, if not ended, so that these young people will stay on the farm and farm as most of them really want to do. Well, I hope so, because uh, I'm beginning to worry about who's going to do the work. And that seems and, to be the problem, doesn't it? And, of course, if there's none of these young fellows left out here to do the work, uh, where will the food come from? Mm -hmm. Corporate farming is not the answer, is it? No, uh, uh, these people have not been uh, too successful. Well, let's uh, just talk for a moment about uh, NFO here in this part of Illinois. Uh, is membership good? Is it growing? Are you encouraged? Membership is good, and it is growing. Uh, I think that uh, Laysell County, Illinois, uh, has a very good uh, organization within itself. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's a lot of unity here, and these people really work good together. Mm -hmm. They're really trying. Well, one of the, the biggest necessities on NFO farms to carry out the NFO marketing structure and grain is storage capacity. And uh, having looked around uh, your farms today, 
You seem to have plenty of grain storage uh, facilities. How many uh, bushels do you have in capacity, Norbert? Uh, we can uh, store and keep uh, 60,000 bushels out here, mm -hmm. Bill. Yeah. And um, I think that this is a must. And we started on this project uh, 10 or 12 years ago, uh, putting up one or two bins at a time. Mm -hmm. And uh, normally, in the summertime, is your better markets. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's almost impossible anymore to take your crop to town or to the elevator or to the market and dump it during the harvest season. That's the old way, isn't it? Well, this is the time that our opposition takes advantage <laughs> of us. Yes, indeed. Now, let's talk about soybeans for a minute and uh, what uh, selling soybeans through NFO has meant to you. Uh, you have sold soybeans this year, stored soybeans, have you not? Uh, NFO has blocked uh, many sales of soybeans together this year. Mm -hmm. yeah, good size blocks of them. And uh, this has had a, an upward price pressure on the whole trade, which mm -hmm. has not only helped uh, the NFO farmer, but it has also helped other farmers. How much uh, have you sold? Approximately 8,000 bushels. What would you say, just as a guess, uh, has been uh, uh, NFO's uh, increase to its members in soybeans uh, this past year? Has it meant a half a dollar? At least. At least a half a dollar. Well, now then, to equate that, uh, in your case, having sold 8,000 bushels, uh, that means that you have realized $4,000 that perhaps you would not have realized without uh, selling through NFO and without NFO's marketing structure. This is very true. What do you think about that, Lois? $4,000 is a pretty nice piece of money, isn't it? Yes, it is, Bill. What can you do with some of that here in the house? Well, um... There are still things that we need to do. There's a patio that has to be poured. Uh oh, she's working some work out <laughs> for you, Norbert. And uh, oh, the, there is um, part of the basement that we would like to maybe make an uh, extra room down. And uh, other than that, we'll take it easy for a while. Well, now, Norbert, you also uh, are raising some cattle and uh, some hogs, aren't you? We have a 35 cow uh, beef herd, mm -hmm. Herefords, and. Uh, then we feed out uh, 50 head of steers and heifers a year mm -hmm. as feeders, and approximately 150 head of, of hemp hogs a year. Norbert, as I understand it, some of the people in this area, some of the farmers who used to uh, run cattle, uh, no longer are doing so. They've torn down their fences. They've turned their land entirely into grain farming. And now that uh, some of them want to come back into the cattle business, it's pretty much of an impossibility for them, isn't it? It would be uh, very much uh, of an impossibility because of the expense of things. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, they cannot go out and replace uh, several hundred rods of woven wire fence, for example, or put up buildings or feedlots. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, of course, when these fellows are out of this livestock operation for several years, uh, they lose uh, their tact or know-how, mm -hmm. so to speak, yeah. and this is not good. Well, isn't it true in the cattle business here as well as uh, throughout most of the country that uh, in order to stay in the business, actually the cattle producer uh, has uh, sold off his breeding stock, and, uh, and this puts us in the dilemma we're in? Well, at the time he sold off his breeding stock, he may have sold a good cow for 250 to $300, and if he was to replace this animal today, it might cost him twice that much mm -hmm. or more. Yeah. Lois, before we leave you all, uh, I would like to ask you this. Uh, you have said that uh, the years you have had with Norbert in NFO have been happy, productive, hopeful years for you as a farmer's wife. What would you say to the uh, farm wives of America in terms of NFO, about joining? Well, <clears throat> I think it's something that we all, all farmers need. And uh, in order to, uh, to uh, be able to fulfill some of their dreams that they've had uh, and to live a better life, I think the NFO is the answer to our problems. I think all farm wives have had a problem in um, wanting things on the farm and uh, maintaining a, a life somewhat that the city people have had. And uh, I think NFO is our answer.
I think that's a rather good point on which to close. May I, in behalf of our entire U.S. Farm Report crew, thank you, Lois, and you, Norbert, for your hospitality. We've enjoyed this very much. You're very welcome, Bill. It's been a pleasure, Bill. Thank you. Well, that was the visit with Norbert Schmidt and his wife and son, very fine people in Streeter, Illinois, and uh, grain farmers uh, of whom your department can be proud, John. Right. Good NFO members. You know, it seems to me that one of the really important aspects of NFO is that it is nationwide and that it has a nationwide communications network. Is that correct? This is right, Bill. I think at this time there should be little doubt in any farmer's mind as to the effectiveness and the potential of a nationwide collective bargaining organization. It's been accepted now by the government, by our leading universities, agricultural universities across the nation, and more readily accepted by farmers every, every, every day. And the effectiveness, there's no argument anymore. You can argue about the degree of effectiveness, but nobody any longer can argue whether or not it is effective because it certainly is. And I think one of the biggest benefits that can be derived from an organization of this type, we do have the government statistics to point out what the potential crop is, but I don't think that it's near as accurate as a farm organization like this that is talking directly each day, every day, through our communication system that we have, which is nationwide, to really know what the crop situation is. And I think in the final analysis, when the crop is all in this fall on corn, it's going to be far short of what the government predictions are at this time. And this, in terms of marketing service, is certainly the benefit to every farmer across the nation, and he should be more than willing for just this service alone to belong to an organization of this type. John, thank you. It's always a pleasure to have you on U.S. Farm Report. Thank you, Bill. It's been a pleasure to be here. My pleasure. My special studio guest has been John Oster. John is assistant director in the Grain Commodity Department at the National Farmers Organization. We also featured Mr. Norbert Schmidt, his wife and son from Streeter, Illinois. U.S. Farm Report is seen on this station each week at this time. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.